Science is white, or science is Western. You know, we, can, we don't have to be reductionist in that way. We can say science generates subjective knowledge. That objective knowledge consists on imminent patterns of becoming that have been discovered in the realm of physics, in the realm of chemistry, in the realm of biology. But using the word law to refer to those imminent patterns gives you the wrong image as to what matter is. And if you're a materialist, you have to care about the image of matter. If you're a materialist and your idea of matter, your concept of matter is an inert receptacle, well, you're already a bad materialist. Because, you know, why would you take as your ally matter when matter is just this stuff that sits there? You know, you might as well call yourself something else. Whereas an active matter, a matter that's pregnant with morphogenetic capacities and tendencies, and gives rise to more and more complexity, as I said, particularly in planets like ours, well, that is something that you can partner with. That is something that you can, that you can associate yourself with and make an alliance with. Let me give you an example, not about a philosopher, but an artist that created this alliance. There's two ways for an architect, or, and I'm going to use an architect as an example right now, to produce a form. You can, produce, you can produce it entirely in your mind, you know, just to, to, to envision, or, you know, in a piece of paper, but using only your mind, and you come up with a form that you want, and then you buy some industrialized material, which just like the labor of economies of scale that we, we talked about yesterday, has been completely routinized and uniformized, many materials, like mild steel, for instance, have been completely uniformized and homogenized. So today, the behavior of mild steel comes in tables. You can tell exactly that if you put so many kilos of, of a load on top of that material, it will behave this way. It will become, it will change in this particular way. The patterns of behavior, the patterns of becoming are already come in tables because they have become routinized. So you can be an architect that, that buys the now routinized matter and imposes a form into that matter, a form that was cerebral. Many architects do that. Or, you can be an architect that wants to partner with matter, that wants form to be the common result of your design and the material tendencies and capacities. A very good example of that, I'm going to write that up here because he, I would consider him to be a nomad scientist, is an Austrian, oh no, I'm sorry, a German His name is Otto, Fry Otto. I believe, I'm not sure if he's still alive. He was still alive just a few years ago, but he was very old. He is very famous, among other things, for because he designed the German pavilion, or some pavilion, in the Munich Olympics of 1968. Remember, every, every country has some pavilion, and... Uh, uh, Fry Otto designed one, and he wanted very specific tent-like roofs with a very specific shape, which is called a saddle, because it, uh, it resembles a saddle in a horse. A saddle in a horse has a double curve. It curves this way along the horse's body, this way, but it also curves this way, so that it can fit the horse, both the horse that way and the horse this way. So it's, it's, a complex, it's a complex form because it has two curves and in, in fact it has a complex geometrical name. It's called a hyperbolic paraboloid. I'm not going to try to push that on you guys because I know it's not going to work like what the hell. It's a doubly curved saddle shaped curve. He wanted those curves for his roofs because as a matter of aesthetic pleasure, those forms gave you the most pleasure. He put several of those in his drawings and he saw, wow, this works beautifully. But, I, you know, at the time, this is 1968, there were computers, but they were not really personal computers, and certainly the, the software that we take it, it, it completely for granted today, 3D software, you know, like in 3D Studio or Maya or those kinds of programs, did not exist at the time. Today, it's very, very easy to create a hyperbolic paraboloid. You simply take a, one of those surfaces that come already with your software, pin, you know, take one of some of the points right, and take some of the points lower them, and bing, but you get your hyperbolic paraboloid. Fry Otto didn't have it. So he said, how am I going to build my maquette? How am I going to calculate those very complex curves? 
So he says, I want to use soap film. You know, I know that film of soap has the internal tendency, the inherent objective tendency of trying to find whatever form minimizes the differences in pressure between the inside or outside, or to put it differently, but equivalently, to minimize surface tension. Is the amount of energy that the, that the bubble has around it. So if it has an inherent tendency, it will, by, left by itself, it will always create a bubble, but if I constrain it, and that's where the artist comes in, it will create a hyperbolic parabola. So what he did is he built, he took a piece of plywood and put a bunch of wooden sticks in the places where the columns that would eventually, of course he's going to do this at the level of a maquette first, at the scale of a maquette, that, and the wooden sticks were where the columns that eventually would be perhaps concrete columns that would sustain the, 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 the roofs would be, and then he hung loosely hanging pieces of thread of a kind of woolly, you know, uh, uh, perhaps, you know, the kind of thing you're doing knitting, kind of woolly thread, but loosely hanging from the tops of those sticks. And so now he had his contribution. He submerged that in a, in a, in a large vat of soapy liquid, very carefully took it out again through the surface so that the bubble wouldn't break, and the film had you know, the film that wanted to make it a little subjective, wanted to create a sphere, couldn't create a sphere because the, thread, the, the wooden threads were constraining it, ended up creating a double-shaped, saddle-shaped curve. In other words, it produced a hyperbolic paraboloid. He, it, it, to put it in more dramatic terms, Fry Otto used soap film as an analog computer to compute the shapes of hyperbolic parabolas. Now, and then of course, he, you know, since the soap, bulb, since the soap film is, it doesn't last very long, and then he took photographs from different angles, had a maquette built now in, in stucco or, 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 or other kind of more durable material, and then, you know, put the, the maquette in a wind tunnel and went through the whole other thing before actually building it. But the actual drawing, the actual, for the first sculpture, so to speak, of his idea, was in partnership with the material. He met so film halfway. You do your thing, which is minimizing surface tension, I'll do my thing. Just constraining, constraining you from becoming a bubble. And from our mutual partnership, from our mutual interaction, the hyperbolic paraboloids will emerge. Well, that is exactly what a nomad scientist would do. A nomad scientist is not trying to get to invent some laws or discover some laws so that he can then say, let there be light, I'm the new god, I'm going to order you to do this. The nomad science, scientist wants to collaborate with, with, with matter in the production of the final form because he or she accepts that matter has inherent tendencies and capacities or singularities and affects that make it not inert, that make it active, that make it something that is worthwhile partnering with. So this is basically, in a nutshell, Deleuze's theory of science. He accepts that the, pa the, the patterns that scientists discover are real, except that he adds the word imminent to, to take away any idea that they are transcendent, as in religion or as in other forms of, 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 of thinking, and says our most important duty to begin with is to replace the notion of law. Every single law that exists, let's replace it with a perhaps longer piece of discourse that is framed exclusively in terms of singularities and affects. Okay, so I'm going to spend the rest of the class today, which basically means half an hour, illustrating, giving you illustrations, giving you examples of those imminent patterns of becoming. I'm going to start with the simplest ones of all, the ones that can be captured by algebraic equations, that is by algebra. And then I'm going, I'm going to move to the, most, the more complex ones, that those, that those that need the differential calculus to be, demand the use of the differential calculus to be, to be produced. But I, I promise I'm not going to write a